We now take a look at a couple of theorems useful with objects of revolution. These enable us to find areas and volumes from the lines and areas used to generate those areas and volumes. The area of a surface of revolution is the product of the length of the generating curve L and the distance traveled by the centroid of that generating curve. In this expression, R bar is the distance from the generating axis to the radial centroid of the generating curve or line. In many cases, this radial centroid will be the same as x bar or y bar, but we need to be mindful of the relationship between the coordinate system and the generating axis. Our last example in this section will provide one illustration where r bar and x bar are not identical. Also in this expression, the angle theta is the angle subtended by the object in radians. If the object is axisymmetric, theta is a full 2 pi radians. But it could be smaller than 2 pi, depending on the application. The object in question may not have a generating curve that consists of a single continuous line. In that case, we can still use the expression but with r bar l replaced with a sum over all segments of the product of r tilde i times l sub i. This follows from the definition of a centroid. The volume of an area of revolution can similarly be described as the product of the generating area a and the distance traveled by the centroid of the generating area. Note that the r bar in this expression is the radial centroid of the area. Here, it may be useful to make the point about the distinction between x-bar and r-bar. Suppose that, for the purpose of describing this area, we had established a Cartesian coordinate system at the bottom left of the generating area. This object has an inner radius, r sub i, and the distance to the centroid in this Cartesian coordinate system is x-bar. Then the relationship between the desired radial centroid and the centroid described in the xy coordinate system is r bar equals inner radius plus x bar. If the generating area is not a simple area, but instead a composite of different shapes, we can still use the expression, but with r bar a replaced with the sum over all segments of the product of r tilde i times a sub i. This again follows from the definition of a centroid. The proofs of these theorems are quite straightforward and are shown here for a solid of revolution. If we consider a differential element of an object of revolution, its differential volume is its circumference, complete or fractional, times its differential cross-sectional area. Calculating the volume by summing over all these differential elements and then using the definition of a centroid produces our result directly. Let's now take a look at a few examples involving this theorem. This first mini example is intended to demonstrate the efficacy of the theorem with a familiar object. In this case we have a hemisphere whose volume we know to be two-thirds pi r cubed. We can look up the centroid of this object from one of the tables in our book and the result is that the radial centroid is 4r over 3 pi. Then the volume is 2 pi r bar a, so that's 2 pi times 4r over 3 pi times the generating area, which is just a quarter of a circle, is 1 quarter pi r squared. Two of these pi's cancel, the fours cancel, and we end up with two-thirds pi r cubed. In this first example, we have a tin coffee cup we might use on a camping trip. It's a thin cup, and the tin's mass density is described as an aerial mass density equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus fifth kilogram per millimeter squared. We want the surface area and weight of the cup, and then the volume and weight of the largest amount of coffee we can put in it. For the density of the coffee, we'll use the mass density of water at standard temperature and pressure. 
This is one gram per cubic centimeter, which we could also write as one times 10 to the minus sixth kilograms per cubic millimeter. Both the generating line of the coffee cup and the generating area inside it are composites. So we will use the composite approach to find the radial centroids of both the generating line and generating area. The generating line can be thought of as a composite of three line segments. If we treat the small triangular segment at the outside bottom corner as a cutout, we can model the generating area as one large rectangle with a small, negatively weighted triangular cutout. Let's now take a look at the details of the solution. We will start by finding the surface area of the tin cup, not including the handle, and so we'll end up with three line segments here with centers at these respective locations. I'll call the bottom segment one, the angled segment two, and the vertical segment three. For the bottom we have the length is 32 millimeters and the radial centroid is just half that length and that's going to be 16 millimeters. For the second segment we might note that we've got a 3, 4, 5 triangle here if we take the square root of the sum of the squares of the 18 millimeters and 24 millimeters we find that that angle of length is 30 millimeters and its radial centroid is 32 millimeters across and then half that 18 millimeter length again so it's going to be 41 millimeters. And then finally for the vertical segment that length is 60 millimeters and that entire segment is 50 millimeters from the center line so that radial centroid is 50 millimeters. If we wanted we could find the centroid of that generating line as a summation of the products of the radial centroids of each component times their individual length divided by the sum of the lengths and in this case we have for our bar 16 millimeters times a length of 32 millimeters plus 41 millimeters times a length of 30 millimeters plus a centroid of 50 millimeters times a length of 60 millimeters over the sum of 32 plus 30 plus 60 millimeters and so this will end up having units of millimeters and the result is that our bar is 38.87 millimeters. We might also note that the total length which is the sum of the 32, 30, and 60 is 122 millimeters. So the total surface area is 2 pi, it's a full object of revolution, so it's 2 pi radians times r bar times L, and if we put in 38.87 millimeters times 122 millimeters, we end up with a surface area that's equal to 2.98 times 10 to the fourth millimeters squared and the weight of the tin then is going to be the aerial mass density times the area times g. So we have 1.5 times 10 to the minus fifth kilograms per millimeter squared times 2.98 times 10 to the fourth millimeters squared and then times 9.81 meters per second squared to get a weight in newtons. So that value turns out to be 4.38 newtons. Now for the second part of this problem we want the weight of the coffee that's in the cup uh, based on filling it to its brim and again I'm going to use this mass density of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms per cubic meter for the mass density of the coffee and now what I'm going to do is consider the ger generating area to be this rectangular area I'm going to call that one 
and I'm going to subtract off this little triangular area here too. That's going to be negatively weighted. So we know that the centers of these, the rectangle is going to be right in the middle here. And then uh, a triangle has a centroid that is a third of the way up from its base or two thirds of the way from its apex. And so let me just bring this down here for a second. Uh, essentially what I'm going to be doing is uh, calculating the centroid here. And this distance is going to be equal to uh, one third of the height, so six millimeters from that outside edge. Okay, so for one, I've got an area that is uh, just 84 millimeters tall times 50 millimeters wide, and that will be 4,200 millimeters squared. And the radial centroid is just uh, half that width, which is going to be 25 millimeters. For the triangular cutout, we have one half the base times the height, and that ends up being 216 millimeters squared, and its radial centroid is 50 millimeters out to the outside edge, less that 6 millimeters in to get to the centroid of the triangular cutout, so that's 44 millimeters. The radial centroid for the generating area then is just the area weighted average of the radial centroids of the individual constituents. So we have 25 millimeters for the rectangle times 4,200 millimeters squared. And then the triangular cutout has a negative weighting, so it's going to end up being minus 44 millimeters times 216 millimeters squared and we calculate the net area as the rectangle less the cutout. This turns out to be equal to 3984 millimeters squared. So our radial centroid is 23.97 millimeters. The volume of coffee then is 2 pi r bar times the area. So we have 2 pi times 23.97 millimeters times 3984 millimeters squared. And that number ends up being 6 times 10 to the fifth cubic millimeters. So the weight of the coffee is its mass density, volumetric mass density, times the volume times g. So we have 1 times 10 to the minus 6th kilograms per cubic millimeter times 6 times 10 to the 5th cubic millimeters times 9.81 meters per second squared. And that gives us a weight for the coffee that's equal to 5.89 newtons. In this second example, we also have a composite area. The base is just a right circular cylinder, so the generating area is a rectangle. The upper portion is bounded on the outside by a hyperbolic curve, so we can use a couple of different integral approaches to find the radial centroid of this area. I'm going to look at this problem two different ways, one where I integrate in y and one where I integrate in x. So for this first solution, I'm going to perform the integration by summing over increments in y. My differential strip is going to be something like this. I can see that the differential element is bound on the left by just x equals 0, and on the right it's going to be bound by x equals 1 over y. So my area increment is going to be the width, which is going to be a function of y, times dy. And uh, that's going to be equal to, since the the right boundary is just 1 over y and the left boundary is 0. Uh, this is just going to be 1 over y minus 0 dy. The x center of this strip is right in the middle of the two bounding curves. Uh, it's going to be a simple average, 1 half of the quantity the right bounding surface plus the left bounding surface, and that just is going to end up being 1 over 2y. So my Radial centroid, in this case, 
is going to be the same as the x centroid for this area bound by the hyperbolic curve. So that's the integral of x tilde dA over the area. We can see that the limits on y go from y equal a half a foot up to two feet, and we have dy over y, which is, getting, which is going to integrate to natural log y between these limits. And that gives us natural log 2 minus natural log a half. Uh, and then we can use the fact that natural log b minus natural log a is the natural log of the ratio b over a. This is natural log 4 feet squared. The integral of x tilde dA is going to be the integral from a half to 2 of x tilde, which is 1 over 2y, times dA, which is dy over y. And that just integrates to minus 1 over 2y between these limits. That ends up giving us 3 quarters feet cubed. So the radial centroid for that top area is the ratio of these two integrals, and that's equal to 0.541 feet. Now we might just note that for the bottom area, since that's a rectangle, its radial centroid is just going to be half of its width, which is going to end up being one foot, and its area is a half a foot times two feet, which is one foot squared. So using our composite approach, we end up with the volume is 2 pi times the sum of the products of the radial centroids and the generating areas. So we end up with 2 pi times 0.541 feet times natural log 4 feet squared, plus we have 1 foot times 1 foot squared. This was 3 quarter cubic feet. So we end up with a volume that's 2 pi times 1 and 3 quarters cubic feet, and that ends up being 11 cubic feet. Now we see that one of the reasons for doing that integral in y is that we have a discontinuous upper bounding curve in x for that orange segment. We can get around that now by dividing this into three segments. We'll have two rectangles. We'll have one on the inside here one on the outside here, and then the hyperbolic curve will require just a single integral in x. Now our differential element is going to look something like this. Focusing on the integral part first, we have a, an area increment which is just the height of this, which is a function of x dx. And now the top curve is just y equals 1 over x, and we can see that the bottom curve occurs at y equals a half, so our height is that difference between the top and bottom bounding curves, and that's just going to be 1 over x minus a half. Our radial center, that differential element, is just x tilde, which is just x, because every material point in that vertical strip is at the same distance from the generating axis. And so now our, our area is the integral uh, again, as it turns out, given the hyperbolic nature of the bounding curve, x goes from a half to 2, and we have h of x dx, so that's going to be 1 over x minus 0.5 times dx. That's going to be natural log x minus 0.5x evaluated between 2 and a half. And we see that that result gives us that the area is natural log 4 minus uh, what will be 3 quarters, or 0.75 feet squared. Now you'll notice that that's not the same area that we calculated previously, but that's because we didn't have that inner rectangle. And you'll notice that the dimensions of that inner rectangle are half a foot in width times a height of 2 minus 0.5, or 1 and a half feet. So that inner rectangular area has an area of uh, 0.75 square feet. And so this result is entirely consistent with our previous calculation. Here's our, our orange area, natural log 4 feet squared. And now we're subtracting off the 
four inch rectangle, which is three quarters square feet. So that result is entirely consistent with our previous calculation. We need to evaluate x tilde dA as well. So again, we're integrating from a half to two feet. x tilde is just x. And we have 1 over x minus 0.5 dx. That integrates very easily to x minus 1 quarter x squared, evaluated between these limits. And that number turns out to be equal to 0.5625 cubic feet. If we want the radial centroid for that area that's bound by the hyperbolic curve, Again, that's equal to the x center, which is the ratio of these integrals. So it's 0.5625 cubic feet over the natural log 4 minus 0.75 feet squared. And that number turns out to be 0.884 feet. So again, if we want the volume, we now have three contributions. So for the Outside area bound by the hyperbolic curve, this is the 0.884 feet times the natural log 4 minus 0.75 feet squared. And then for the inner rectangular area, its center is half of its width, which is 0.25 feet, and its area is 0.75 feet squared. And then we have the bottom rectangular base again, which has a radial centroid of one foot times a generating area of one foot squared. And all of that, again, turns out to be equal to 11 cubic feet. Finally, we have a problem that requires us to find the total mass of concrete needed to make a dam of the dimension shown. This example will differ from the previous examples in two important ways. First, the dam only subtends a fraction of a complete revolution, so the angle theta will be something other than 2 pi. In this case, theta will be pi over 3 radians. Second, it will be easier to examine the centroid of the composite shape using a coordinate system positioned at the lower left corner of the dam. This gives us the radial coordinate of the centroid only after we have added the radial distance between the generating axis and the origin of that coordinate system. Let's now take a look at the complete solution. So we'll establish this local coordinate system again in the lower left corner of the dam cross section, which we are representing as a composite of a square and a quarter circle area. So I'll use one to designate the square, and that's got a centroid right in the middle, obviously. And then the, qu the quarter circle cutout I'll call 2, and its centroid is over here somewhere, and, and we can look that up. That actually turns out to be 4r over 3 pi. So first, for the square outline, the area there is just 80 meters times 80 meters, so that's 6,400 square meters, and its center is half that width, which is just going to be 40 meters. For the quarter circle cutout, its area is 1 quarter pi r squared, and using a radius of 70 meters, that turns out to be 38, 48 meters squared. And its center is, again, 4 r over 3 pi, and if we put 70 meters in there for the radius, we end up with 29.7 meters for uh, the centroid of that quarter circle area. Okay, so the center of the whole thing is just the area weighted average of the centers of the individual pieces. We have a negative weighting for the quarter circle since it's a cutout. And so we end up with 40 meters times 6,400 meters squared. Uh, then we're going to have an, a negative weighting for the area, so it's a minus 29.7 is, uh, is the value of the centroid of the quarter circle. 
and then times 38, 48 meters squared over the difference between 6,400 and 38, 48 meters squared. And that gives us a value X bar of 55.5 meters measured from this local coordinate system on the inside left corner of the dam cross section. So now our volume is theta times r bar a, and we have to write this as, again, first pi over 3, because it's only a segment of a revolution, just a 60 degree angle, but we express that in radians, so pi over 3, and then r bar is the inner radius, which is 120 millimeters, plus the 55.5 that we just calculated, and the total area is the 6400 minus 3848 meters squared. That turns out to give us 4.69 times 10 to the fifth cubic meters of concrete. That's a lot of concrete. And the total mass involved then is volumetric mass density times volume. It's 2.4 megagrams per cubic meter times 4.69 times 10 to the fifth meters cubed, and that ends up giving us 1.13 times 10 to the sixth megagrams, or 1.13 times 10 to the ninth kilograms of concrete. That's, that's 1.13 billion kilograms of concrete.